Hello and welcome back. I hope everyone had a very nice workshop experience and a good lunch break. Um, this is the fourth session of our conference, uh, dealing with prejudice, discrimination and hate speech. Um, and this session, we are talking about difference and being different all the time. This session will be a bit different than we had planned because unfortunately one of our speakers can't be with us physically. Um, he made it to Berlin yesterday, but then the German Bundesbahn went on strike and he was stuck there. Uh, so now Andreas Zick uh, will be with us in a minute um, on the screen. And <laughs> we're, we're very happy for the new technologies <laughs> that make that possible. It wouldn't have been previously. Uh, so, so let me introduce him. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Zick, Professor Zick is director of the Institute of Interdisciplinary Research on Conflict and Violence, and he's also professor for socialization and conflict research at the Faculty of Educational Science at the University of Bielefeld. And we have invited him here because we think that the research that he and his research group is doing comparative European research on prejudices, group-focused enmity, is really groundbreaking and that it has very much to contribute in, on, our, on our conference when we're thinking about how addressing the past, teaching history and um, dealing with historical issues, narratives and also conflicts can contribute to the prevention of escalating conflicts today. We learned earlier today that a certain level of conflict needs to be acknowledged in any democratic society, but what we're now talking about is a dynamic of violence, and Professor Zick will tell us a lot about the phenomena and the roots and possible solutions. So I, I'm going to say the floor is yours, Mr. Zick. Okay. Hello, everybody. I don't see you. I don't hear you. Uh, I'm f director of a research center at University of Bielefeld. If you look at Wikipedia, you will see that Bielefeld doesn't exist. So it's all a rumor. Now I'm going to speak about a couple of minutes about the group focused enmity approach. I will show you a lot of numbers, a lot of data because we run a cross European survey and uh, don't bother about the data. You can have the slides. I already sent it to Warsaw. Unfortunately, I'm not in Warsaw. I love Warsaw. I wanted to have a nice evening together with you, but things uh, happen. So people need work, money, uh, so I understand the strike. So what's going on in Europe today? On the one side, you see people are welcoming refugees, migrants. On the other hand, especially in Germany, there's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of prejudices, racism. There's a lot of uh, distance towards these refugees. There's a European right turn. So last year we had the European, the votes for the European Parliament and you see there's a right wing shift across Europe. Right wing populism is on the rise. What do we see on the streets in Germany? We see that people think they are cheated. Our president is Mr. Gauck and this, this sign shows that we are, we are vergaukelt, which means we were cheated by the president. On the streets in Germany, you see, stop multiculturalism. My home has to stay German. You see, no Islamization of Europe. A lot of people believe that we are is in, a, in a route, in a way of Islamization. Our country has to be our own. You know about, maybe know about this Pegida demonstrations in Saxonia. Saxonia remains German. Mrs. Merkel, we are the folks, we are the people. Stop with cheating and we have to be brave to say the truth. And 
a lot of people arguing against immigration, arguing against diversity, who fear a threat of, uh, of the, all the topics you talked about, they argue, we are the tolerant people, we are no Nazis, and we are all citizens of one nation. So after this short introduction, I want to sketch you a bit about the, con the, the concept of enmity. Then I will show you some data across Europe. I will refer to some of the roots of discrimination and racism we observe in U Europe, some outcomes because prejudice is discrimination is a tool for something. And then let's talk about some exits. So what about enmity? We speak about prejudice, discrimination, etc. in the public, and uh, societies are changing and moving when we observe terror, violence, when we have elections like the last European votes for the European Parliament, we saw there's a shift to the far right. When we see stigmata, when we see populism, hate speech in the internet, extremism, then people are alarmed and they start to speak about discrimination. What we argued a couple of years ago is that if you observe these phenomena on the surface of the iceberg, like populism, hate speech, they all rest on attitudes, sentiments, on group-focused enmity, which is much more in the center of every society. And we argued that we don't only have to observe one kind, one facet, and don't have to focus and concentrate on one single pattern of prejudices, but we know since the 30s, since the 40s, since we collect data, that if you observe one kind of prejudice, this goes along with other prejudices. So if we observe racism, people who are racist, they have a high probability to be anti-Semitic, to be anti-Muslim, etc., etc. And these discriminations not only go against the strangers, the, the, the groups which come to, with, to a country, but... Uh, this discrimination all, also goes against groups within the society, disabled people, homeless people, people without work. And these different patterns are linked. And this is why we talk about a syndrome of group focused enmity. It's not an individual sentiment. What we observe is an individual sentiment of anti-Semitism, but it is an attitude you express as a member of a group against an outgroup. This is why we call it group-focused enmity. And we ask ourselves, what's all about it? What's behind all these different patterns of prejudice? There are different rules of anti-Semitism than for Islamophobia or anti-Muslim prejudices. Different roots cause um, prejudices against uh, people who don't have work. But we think and we believe that there's one heart, and this core is an ideology of unequal worth between groups. As soon as people in a society believe that the different groups are of unequal worth, and I don't speak about economic equality, but simply about the estimation of groups. If there's an inequality in, in estimation, and this is okay, this is how societies work, they believe in an uh, ideology of unequal worth, then they are prone to develop this syndrome of group-focused enmity. So let's see what's, what's, what we observe across Europe. We run surveys. We did one survey across Europe. It's a couple of years ago, but data show us that the pattern are nearly the same now. Um, uh, we did a survey where we measured uh, different facets of uh, prejudices what we call group focused enmity across countries, and we test it for equivalence in measurements. So we really can compare the patterns of prejudice in every country. So it's equivalent. What we observe is on the first hand, if you use the scale of different uh, facets of prejudice, we see an east west difference. This is what surveys tell for a very long time. So Portugal, Poland, and Hungary, where we could run this survey, higher level of group-focused enmity, racism, anti-immigrant attitudes, anti-Muslim, sexism, etc. Then in the West, in the more established democracies, in Western world, lower levels. But when it comes to single patterns, for example, here you see anti-black racism, even high levels of racism in the Western European countries. 
Yeah, so now the difference in the total scale of enmity disappears. There's a natural hierarchy between black and white people. One third of the German population believes in classical old-fashioned blatant racism. The difference disappears when it comes to anti-immigrant attitudes. Now we have Great Britain and countries like Germany higher and comparable to Poland and Hungary. Now it comes to anti-immigrant attitudes. In one example, there are too many immigrants. This is what we hear now because we have a huge wave of immigration, of refugees, people lo looking for asylum. Uh, people in the, in the, who resist immigration always argue there are too many. Compared to the numbers, you see them below, there are not too many immigrants. But it's a pattern of prejudice. There are too many immigrants. You see Great Britain, more than 50% in our representative survey agreed to such a statement. In Italy, more than 60%. And now you see Poland, for example, low ratio of immigrants, but also a low level of anti-immigrant attitudes. The East-West difference disappears. There is an East-West difference in traditional anti-Semitism, for sure. But there are new patterns of prejudice. I will come to them in a minute. Um, Anti-Muslim attitudes, absolutely no difference across the country. So the difference between the countries does not become significant anymore. Anti-Muslim attitudes across Europe. This might explain why there is a big wave of anti anti-Islam, anti-Muslim sentiments across Europe. Well, what we observe in Germany, now in Germany we have data for 12 years, is there is this pattern, we call it the precedent rights of the established. This goes back to an approach by Norbert Elias about the insiders and the outsiders. So you have prejudices against any new group which enters the society. And you argue that uh, these newcomers in your society first have to stay behind. They have to stay on a lower status level because we were the first. We came first. It's a rejection of any kind of new group. And when we come to Germany, and this is data for Germany, for 12 years, this rights of the established is increasing now. This might explain uh, this right-wing populist movement because the right-wing populists, they are not targeted. They against specific groups, yeah, for sure against Islam and Muslims, but also a lot of other groups against newcomers in society. And this also works on a very subtle way. There are a lot of students now in Warsaw. We run a study in Dresden at the Technical University, and we asked 60 students in psychology. In psychology, we have numerous clauses. It's very uh, high. There's a high threshold to get a place. We asked students to help us to select people uh, for becoming uh, students in psychology. Um, we said, we told them, uh, please help us to evaluate applicants who like to get access and like to get uh, a place to study psychology. So high ranked study. Please help us. And you can take a map and check the map, and then you can evaluate uh, the map and tell us, should this, should this uh, person get access uh, to the study psychology? So in here you see some of uh, the students, they had a map, and they saw in the map Julia Richter. She was born in 87, born in Erfurt. Now she's living in Berlin in the March, Marktstraße 28. She's German. She's single. She's not married. And her degree at school, so in German, mathematics, English, the average is 2.1. This is Julia Richter. And you can think about, is Julia Richter able to study psychology? Um, you get a bit more information. Now a completely other group received Justinia Gorich Gorichka. And you see, she's also born in February 87. She's born in Erfurt. She's living in Berlin in the Marktstraße, German, single, and her average is the same like Julia Richter, but she has a Polish name. And another group, a third group, saw this applicant, is Julia Unsal. Same data, we changed only the name. And if you see, it's the same person. We simply changed the clothes. Now, what you see is, are they generally uh, able to study in Dresden. 
in this high excellence studies of psychology. Yeah, the East German applicant and the Polish publicant much more than the estimated Muslim part participant, especially the Polish uh, applicant, because in Dresden we know that Polish students coming from school, they learned a lot, they are high skilled. Then we ask, are they able to study psychology? And now you see a clear rank. The East German applicant much more able to study psychology than the Polish and last uh, the Muslim applicant. And then now the rights of the established, should, they, should the applicant get access to study directly at our place in Dresden? And now you see first the East German, Julia, then the Polish and the Muslim applicant. Yeah, so you see no direct prejudices, but an indirect est uh, establishment of the rights of the proceedings. Now, some elements of the syndrome of group force enmity are tabooed and outlawed. But, and we argue that, however, they find their way by communicating enmity in modern, very subtle expressions. We are high skilled persons. We know that we cannot express uh, prejudices, so we have to be careful. Um, enmity is very strong if these traditional elements and expressions can be transformed into a zeitgeist. So prejudices are closed by the zeitgeist and then they can be expressed in a very subtle way even by high-skilled, high-educated people. And this is exactly what we observe when it comes to secondary anti-Semitism, which is a final strike under the history um, of, of the Shoah and reversal of the guilt. Here you see an East-West difference, but when it comes to secondary anti-Semitism, high, high value in Germany. Much, and you see Sweden, I now uh, lighted up Sweden, we only had a very small sample in Sweden, so it is not representative, that why I'm a bit shy to show it. But when it comes to Israel-related anti-Semitism, anti which is communicated against Israel, so Israel, what they are doing in Palestine, the war in Gaza, this is a Jewish policy, and this is why I don't like Jews. No difference, classical difference, and much higher values now. The scale runs from one to, one to four high, very high values in every country. And when it comes uh, to Israel-related anti-Semitism, we have about 40% of people, 50, more than 50%, 60% in Poland, yeah, agreeing to Israel-related anti-Semitism. Israel is conducting a war of extermination against the Palestinians. This is one example out of our survey. High values. Even in Germany, 48% agree that it's a war of extermination. And this is the language of how we in the past, how we in the past um, explained what the Nazis did, extermination. Now it's transferred to what um, people in Israel are doing. And this, the, what we see in the surveys is essentialized in the internet, in the internet communication. I cannot go into detail, but there's a lot of evidence. It's what we observe in the offline world is observed as well in the online world. So there's one study by Holz and Wagner in Vienna, 2009. They uh, examined nearly 5,000 postings of right-wing blogs, main target groups in the blogs, African Jews, Muslims, Polish, Turks. The topics, is all the topics we observe in the service. is conspiracy, criminality, exploitation, threat to identity, infiltration, mind control, persecution, Etc. And they especially observed how how Jewish uh, groups are are, um, are are imaged within the internet, and it's exactly the same we observe in the survey. So Jews appear as their own kind; uh, they separate from society, and they have power and influence. Uh, we also observe that in the internet, and this is what you are going to discuss in Warsaw, is a very uh, good measure now to link people. What you here observe is an analysis of communication of a very right-wing extremist groups. In Germany, you have, we have these autonomous na nationalists. They distance themselves from the critical groups, but they are very violent. 
And we analyze here in Bielefeld the way how they communicate and how they link each other. And this is a nice picture of a communication in the Web 2.0 showing how they link. So there's a core group and this core group is communicating with some separated groups, but it's a very stable communication and linking. So in the internet you have the images and in the, in the internet you have the ability to link people to develop a community. So what about the roots? I can talk many hours about the different roots because there are multiple roots to prejudices, discrimination, multiple roots to anti-diversity uh, sentiments. I will highlight some of the roots. When it comes to the roots, you have factors within, within the, on the individual level, demographics, dispositions. The most important factors we know when it comes to group-focused enmity are factors on the group level. So, um, beliefs of groups, etc. But you can also um, grow up within a cultural context which is, which is very discriminatory and without any individual um, factors you, you, you are prone to be prejudiced because in the context there's um, something which makes you to become enemy. So demographics, yeah. In all our surveys, you speak a lot about education. We need education. And there's a clear, clear significant difference between people who are low educated and high educated. You see on this slide, anti-Semitism. It decreases with education in every country we observed. And it's a very clear effect. We call it the poor educated racism effect. In the 80s in the US, uh, uh, there's a lot of data showing that. But... When it comes to modern, subtle facets, this difference in education completely disappears. Here's a slide showing antisemitism related to Israel, traditional antisemitism, red line, secondary, traditional antisemitism. And you see the difference in education, low educated, medium educated people, high educated people, in secondary and anti-Israel related antisemitism disappears. So no effect of education. One of the most important um, uh, effects of education is, yeah, here in the slide, you see anti-Semitism is linked with education. Low educated people have a higher level of anti-Semitism. What you don't see is, this is a measure of traditional old-fashioned anti-Semitism. Jewish people have too much influence. They don't care anything about only about themselves, etc. But when it comes to an attribution of positive things, for example, admiration, sympathy, and the next slide shows this, is the difference in education disappears. So the modern form of prejudice of anti-Semitism and other kinds of enmity, the modern forms of uh, which uh, is, for ex is, or the subtle form of uh, prejudice is, I have nothing against them, but... At the, at the same time, you don't have nothing in favor of them. So a neglect of admiration, a neglect of sympathy, no difference between education and anti-Semitism, which means that in education you don't learn to attribute positive things to the group. You learn a lot about what you don't have to say, a lot about norms, tabooing, etc. But I think we have to learn to attribute positive things to the groups. This is why I like the concept of diversity, etc. you are discussing in Warsaw. I look to my watch uh, to see how much time. So this is a neglect of sympathy and admiration to immigrants. No difference in education. So high people, high educated people reject sympathy and admiration. More important for prejudices is are the factors on the group level. The most important factors, this is a complicated slide. We tested on the group level a lot of things which can explain uh, group-focused enmity, GFE. So we measured authoritarianism, perceived threats of immigrants, anti-diversity beliefs, social dominance orientation, which means a power orientation, political alienation, political orientation, religiousness, financial situation, relative deprivation, so my group, is suffering more than another group, and different levels of identification, identification with Europe, with the country, and with the region. We see that there are some, on the group level, some universal factors. Authoritarian attitudes, 
perceived threat by immigration, anti-diversity beliefs and dominance orientations explain group of enmity in every country. The other factors are not so strong in the other countries all over. They are stronger in single countries. For example, in Poland, you see that the identification with the region, with a certain part of the society, my identification with, with the region is, is explaining group-focused enmity, and this is in Poland, not in the other countries. So it's not the national identification, but it's a regional identification. Yeah, But the other factors universally explain... Uh, group focused enmity. You see this effect here uh, of identification a bit more clearly. Here you see identification, people who are low identification, it's a bit lighter bar, the darker bars, uh, high identifiers with Europe, with the, my own country, so national pride, and with my region. And you see, people, if people identify with Europe, it has no effect on um, group focused enmity. Yeah. But identification with the region or national identification with the country, high identifiers are more prone um, for group-focused enmity. Another factor is, and this is unfortunately only in German, uh, it's people criticize democracy. We, what we observe in this demonstra in demonstrations in Germany now on Monday uh, it's coming down, but it's still there, is a lot of people say, well, democracy has failed. So they criticize democracy. Yeah, And here you see that those who criticize democracy, democratic critic, and group-focused enmity in, are, are highly correlated. So people de uh, criticizing democracy show a higher level of uh, group-focused enmity. Uh, I skip this because I want to come to the context and some roots. Now, uh, coming to the context, we have some context factors. One context factor is we observed in Germany, and I have only that data for Germany, that if we compare people in our data who are living in a region where the right-wing extremist parties have a success, these are the dark red bars here. Uh, when the right-wing extremists uh, come to uh, succeed our 5% quota coming to a local communal parliament or a federal parliament, uh, then the level of traditional anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, and, and new modern facets of anti-Semitism increases. So the, there's an effect, right-wingers, when they enter the parliament, the level of anti-Semitism is increasing within the region, even if people don't vote for right-wing extremists, which means there's a context effect, yeah, which has an impact on what we have to do against prejudices and racism. There's another context effect. Here you see uh, group-focused enmity, anti-Muslim, anti-Islam attitudes and anti-asylum seeker attitudes in different federal states of Germany. The darker the area, I hope you see it, the higher GFV anti-Muslim attitudes and anti-asylum seeker attitudes. And what you see is that in those federal states where are less Muslim and uh, Muslim people are living, where there are less anti-asylum -asy seekers, you have higher levels of prejudices. This is in context effects. The less people have the ability to get into contact with people, the higher the enmity within the countries. These are the different federal states uh, in Germany. Now, some outcomes. There are a lot of outcomes of prejudices. That's not only a single. So one outcome is prejudices are threatening the target groups. There's a dissolidarization within society. People who are prejudiced, they don't they show a less degree of solidarity. There's a disintegration. We clearly can show that prejudices cause a rejection of integration. An integration, people who are highly prejudiced, they don't like diversity, they don't like the integration of people. Prejudices are only tools. They work for discrimination. Prejudices work for exclusion and pre prejudices work for violence. One of the effects we can show, we have panel data. We interviewed 10 years, identically the same people. And what we clearly can show is, this is a very 
a simple graph that people who have anti-Muslim attitudes in 2006, they have a significant probability that in the forthcoming years, 2008 and 10, we interviewed them again, are against the integration of foreigners, immigrants, and especially Muslims. So the prejudices call an anti-integration attitude, and it's not the reverse. Okay, uh, I skip that because I have to come to an end. One problem uh, is that fighting prejudice is one thing. But when we look now to the campaigns against immigration, to campaigns against diversity, we also have to take into mind that fighting prejudice may be only one aspect in educating against discrimination, educating against prejudices. We in Bielefeld think that more and more in this discourse, we need to think about processes of radicalization within the society, not only at the margins. What we observe in our, in our data, there is across Europe a high crisis of confidence in the democratic system. So there's a lot of legal protest. This is not a problem. But our models of radicalization so, uh, show that there's this crisis of confidence with some people, with some groups, can lead to a crisis of legitimacy. So people look for an open confrontation. They look for singular events of uh, violence against the silent citizens, against uh, refugees. This is what we observe now. We have an increase in hate crimes all over Europe. So some people are transferring the legal protest to a crisis of legitimacy. This is not the end. If it happens that this crisis of legitimacy of the system leads to a crisis of legitimization, so the democratic systems cannot legitimize itself, then, which is expressed in patterns of dehumanization, depersonalization, etc., then we have a high probability of violence and terror. And what our models of radicalization show us is that anti-democratic propaganda, anti-democratic agitation is needed to trigger this process of radicalization. So I very much like to discuss, and unfortunately I'm not in Warsaw, to speak about this process of radicalization within society where prejudices and discrimination takes place. Just one last thing, what are from my perspective the basic important exits? We need more tolerance within the society, we need more moral courage within societies, and we have to think about the attribution of positive, uh, of positive fe features, of positive emotions, of positive uh, cognitions to the group. So we need equal worth attribution. I don't speak about any kind of uh, tolerance. Tolerance, which, which is only permitting groups, is not linked to any kind of positive effect. A tolerance which only allows the coexistence of groups is not linked to, to any kind of positive attitude. Even respect, so they have the same rights for moral reasons, is not linked to positive attitudes toward groups. But only, and I can show it empirically, only appreciation of groups. So my ethic preference of the of the uh, positive value of diversity. This can block. This can be a hurdle to group focused enmity in societies. We need more moral courage. We need to perceive discrimination and racism much more clearly in societies. We need a good interpretation that this is a problem. Uh, we have to take responsibility, we have to speak about what is the best strategy to fight it, and then we need to decide to act. This is what I can tell you. I'm very sorry not to be there. I'm very sorry not to hear you. I stop my talk here uh, because I think uh, you need Marte now can comment and discuss with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you very much, Professor Sick. 
Uh, I'm getting very daring right now, and I think maybe we can even try one or two questions for you. Is there any question to Professor Zick? Personally, I, I, I think it's a very pity not only that you can be here, but also that Professor Schaeffler, Peter Schaeffler, has left, because I see that there's a lot of tension between what you just presented and what, what he presented earlier today, for example, when it comes to the positive attributions. So it would have been very nice to have you two discussing, um, but I think we will take this with us. The, at least for me, it is very interesting to, to see this uh, uh, advice on the one hand, not to, to romanticize diversity, but also from your side to say that there needs to be a counterbalance, uh, there needs to be more than just tolerating coexistence at a, dis at a distance, there needs to be appreciation. So now I look again into the room, are there questions for Professor Zick? Yes, there is one. Hello. Uh, I have a question about this research because we saw a lot of data and I would like to know uh, what were the participants, like how you selected them, yeah. uh, because you were talking about anti-multicultural some, some kind, and, uh, and uh, how did you select the participants to this research? Should I answer directly? Yes, please. Okay. So, I don't, didn't go into much uh, into detail with the methods. The, the numbers you saw, uh, you saw, and you can have the slides, uh, came from um, surveys with representative national samples we run. So we are selecting from uh, the nation's samples by indicators. It's not representative for the total society. The term representative is a very is a public term, but it's a, it's a sample with a high probability that it is representing uh, the different countries, um, and we did them by face to face interviews, but also by telephone interviews. We tested for the methods. We before we go into the field, we also are running qualitative face to face interviews. Because when you study the prejudices, uh, you first have to study if uh, in, the, in the national context, in the cultural context, um, these stereotypes and prejudices and utterances uh, make sense for the people. So this is what I show you in the numbers, is this cl classical research. But in our institute, we also run a lot of other studies. For example, when we study discrimination of disabled people, uh, normally you, it makes no sense to do a paper pencil or telephone or some face-to-face -face interview, but we use indirect me measures, for example, in behavior, like social distance. You distance yourself from a handicapped uh, person. Thank you. I see one Two more questions, maybe we ask them after each other, collect them, then a last answer, and then we proceed further. Um, hello, Professor. I'm a scholar from India. Uh, ah, hello. Hello. Uh, my question is also about your research. Uh, I am wondering about the gender and the age component of the research. Yeah. Because in India, we have this uh, issue of Bangladeshi migration into India. Yeah. And, uh, there was a recent survey by TIS, which is uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, uh, which showed that there was a clear difference in terms of gender. For instance, Bangladeshi women are more accepted as migrant, but not men, because uh, they are supposed to be the ones who create a lot of aggression in the society. So do you see uh, anything of that sort in the research that uh, you did? Yeah. Um, there are a lot of studies 
I thought you asked me if uh, women or men who who is more prejudiced, the elderly, the younger. Um, because in our data, there's an interesting uh, pattern um, when it comes to racism, anti-immigrant attitudes, and we interview um, we interview people. Women have a higher level than men, so um, so there's a gender effect. Um, and it's interesting to discuss it because it has to do with gender identity. And when it comes to age, elderly people, and now in the last years uh, in Europe, we, saw, we see that people between 16 and 31 are more prone to be prejudiced. But you ask another question. You ask if people have a specific attitudes towards women, towards men. Now, um, I know some studies in Europe showing that uh, people, when it comes to immigrants, um, they, they, the, the, the primary group uh, people reject is young male immigrants. Because there's a stereotype that young male immigrants are more threatening. Um, then we have some studies showing that um, people show a higher acceptance of children of immigrants than of, of, the, of the elderly generation. So there's, there's a, a mix between a positive image of children and um, immigration. Um, and when it comes to age, um, this is what, what I told before. Some studies, for example, this Pew Center or there's an European trend line uh, study, uh, good data across, uh, across Europe show that uh, the primary group who is rejected is young, is male immigrant. And the last question. Does it work? Yes. I have a question mm. and a comment uh, uh, in, in, uh, concerning one of your slides. Did I get it well that uh, it, sh it seems that if you have a stronger national and regional identity, the risk of group enmity, yeah. group focus enmity is higher? Yes? Did yeah. I get it right? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, and if you really can prove it, yeah. And I hope you can. It could be a very courageous and a very straightforward suggestion on the uh, systemic approach of the national educational systems yeah. to uh, how we should uh, go around national and regional education. Yeah. I have always hoped that if you talk about national and regional identity in yeah. a wise way, and I still do hope that it doesn't have to uh, make the risk bigger. But maybe yeah. we have uh, just to abandon yeah. parts of our regional and national identity courses and uh, highlights and to have more education towards diversity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I have so many days. I exactly <laughs> okay. agree. We have a long discussion in Germany about this link of national pride, national stolz, and prejudices and right-wing extremism. How to get rid of that? And one of, uh, one of the proposals is you don't need a national identification. It's enough to identify with the constitution. The problem is how can we explain how can we explain, how can we, ed can we educate constitutional identification? So it's an identification with democracy, with the rules, etc., etc. So we have to discuss it. So what's an alternative? National identification, yeah, in Germany, you know, we are world champions in football for the next year. So uh, it's, it's, it's hard. Uh, it, 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 it's hard to leave to, to, to give up the national identification for a lot of people. The other interesting point is there's a belief that maybe we can find an identif identification, an identity which is linking all of us. So the world society, but our data shows 
that identification, for example, with Europe has no effect on prejudices. So, yeah, I completely agree. Um, when you start to speak about the region, when you start to explain the nation and how we can identify, identify with it, you have to take into to mind that this identity, this identification is linked to a differentiation and it can be linked to prejudices and discrimination. I think diversity, the image of a multicultural society, can be an alternative. Thank you. This is now we have like now we have arrived at the question of thick and thin identities, I think. Yeah. Uh, and here it's a brilliant bridge to history. What what um, role can history, historical consciousness, our narratives, the, the narratives of belonging um, and belonging to different kind of communities play in preventing group focused enmity? Um, I thank you very much. I, I just want to say there are two more points which I think we take from your lecture. Um, and, and this is... Um, <laughs> now I have a, a small blackout. I had two points. <laughs> no, um, no it is, it's the, the notion of belonging, I think, which, which links to, to history. Um, and the other two points have gone. They probably come back when you, because you grew so big, you know, now you're a bit big brother here for us. <laughs> you, you, you grow really big at the screen, impressive. Uh, but I think we thank you. It won't be possible to, to have you with us for Marte Michelet's contribution, but I think we should give you a big applause. Thank you. I hear the applause. Okay, um, now I introduce the, the next speaker, um, Marte Michele, um, and she is a journalist and author. She is quite well known in, in Norway um, as a journalist who has a very critical voice as a, an, as a commentator on issues of racism and Islamophobia, has been so for quite some years now, um, but last year she, she got another aspect uh, to her profile. She wrote or published a book uh, about the Norwegian Holocaust, the persecution of the Norwegian Jews, and the title is The Biggest Crime, Victims and Perpetrators in the Norwegian Holocaust. Um, and she, she received a very relevant prize, Braga Prisen, for it. Uh, and I think that that shows something uh, about what, what this book and what highlighting this part of a collective narrative means for Norway. And I think this is also what she mostly will be focusing on now. So we are taken from the contemporary situation in Europe to addressing history, and I think with Marte Michelet, we have a person who really can build the bridges between the two. Give a warm hand to Marte. I, I have one organizational thing, because I see people are leaving. I was asked to really remind you to, to deliver the headsets, because otherwise, maybe if you're traveling, you are without your ID paper. So remind giving back the headsets. And <laughs> filling out the evaluation sheet. Thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for an excellent speech, um, Professor Sick. I, I don't think he can, he can hear me, but that was my opinion anyway. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to come here. It's my first time in Warsaw. Uh, it's my first time at your fantastic museum. Um, and I'll be speaking mainly, as you said, about uh, the book that I published last year and the discussion that that book created in Norway um, over the past months. And I'll hopefully be drawing some lessons from that which will be helpful to you. But first, uh, during um, uh, Professor Sick's speech, I, I couldn't stop thinking about uh, an example from yesterday. Because yesterday, as I was traveling from Stockholm, where I, uh, where I now live, I've moved from, from Norway, uh, there was a big news story that um, in a medium-sized town in western Sweden called Varberg. 
An 88-year-old man, uh, a Holocaust survivor, was yesterday giving a lecture uh, at a school, high school, uh, in, in, in this little town. Uh, and the meeting was interrupted by six uh, neo-Nazis who marched in on, uh, on his lecture. They didn't do anything. They marched in, uh, in a row. Uh, a few of them were dressed like skinheads. Um, they uh, didn't shout any slogans um, or perform any act of violence. They just went to the front row, sat down on the front row, and started taking pictures behind them of the audience with their mobile phones. Um, even though nothing sort of very dramatic happened, this, whole, this incident created a, a, very, a very startled and intimidated um, uh, feeling in the Swedish public. I mean, this was a news story. It's sort of a non-event. Six people come into a room, nothing happens. <laughs> but, just, but, but the reason that we are so intimidated and the reason that this audience was terrified of their presence is, of course, that they knew. They knew that if these six men had met this 88-year-old Holocaust survivor, not in that hall, but in a dark street somewhere, they would gladly have beaten him to death. And the audience knew that the, the picture taking uh, was a way of saying, we're watching you. Uh, it's dangerous uh, to be here, um, to collude with the Jews. It's dangerous to even listen to the Jews. Um, and I think this, th these men, they belong to uh, a neo-Nazi organization which is called the Swedish Resistance Movement. And they afterwards proudly, uh, in, a, in a press, uh, um, they sent to the press that they proudly uh, took responsibility for this bullying of this Holocaust survivor. Uh, and I think, okay, there are a couple of things that this incident serves to highlight and that, that work uh, perfectly with what uh, Professor Sick drew up for us here. Number one, uh, the Nazi stormtroops, they did not vanish from uh, Europe in 1945. Uh, they're still there as a presence in several European countries today. And secondly, the, uh, the imagery, the historical imagery of Nazism is very active in people's minds. Uh, even among high school students who were probably dragged to sit at this lecture and they yawn at history lessons, uh, immediately when they identify uh, symbols of Nazism, they are scared and they immediately identify them. It's a vivid and alive historical imagery. And the third point which we could make about this is that no one in this audience probably supports the Swedish resistance movement. It's, an, it's a small, um, very, uh, very, um, very weird <laughs> and militant group. But in the same town, in Varberg, 15% of the voters voted for the Swedish Democrats in the recent election. And um, this party has clear and proven roots in the white supremacy and um, uh, neo-Nazi movements. And the Swedes have been consistently warned repeatedly and vocally, especially uh, in, the, in, the, in, in media campaigns uh, pre, uh, prior to the elections, with, ab about these connections and about this history, that this party uh, has members and, uh, and spokespersons who deny the Holocaust. They talk warmly about Hitler. Uh, they uh, wear SS uniforms at parties and so on. All of these, um, these searchings that the media is extremely interested in, in, in sort of the dirty underwear of the, the, the fringes of the Swedish Democratic Party, it has no effect. Uh, before the elections last fall, there was, there was a, story, a story almost every day uh, revealing some kind of Nazi affiliation to the Swedish Democrats. And it didn't matter. They still uh, received record high uh, numbers in Sweden uh, in the elections. And this is what, what Professor Sick was also talking about. We see this all over Europe now. Former Nazis uh, who put on suits and soften their re rhetoric and start talking more about Muslims than Jews 
uh, they receive alarming percentages of the vote. And it seems that the voters know, but they don't care. Um, for most of the post-war era, being Nazi-affiliated meant that you were untouchable in politics, that you would, uh, your party would never get anywhere. But this is shifting. And I've, I've spoken to many uh, political analysts and, um, and um, uh, people who, who, are, who uh, uh, do research on right-wing populist parties, and this is kind of a puzzle. Why doesn't uh, the fear of Nazism and the affiliation with Nazism work anymore? Why is that uh, not something that pushes people away from the, from the right-wing populist parties? And why is, uh, why is it easier? Why doesn't it matter at all that the leader of the Pegida movement in Germany uh, has the connections to the Nazi right-wing uh, that he does? Um, okay, so th these are things to keep in mind when we talk about what history can or cannot do uh, in this Europe, which is... Uh, increasingly involved in deep and flammable um, conflicts about race, migration, national identity, and so on. Um, in the outline to the text of this seminar, uh, it states that often those who express negative attitudes towards minorities are not aware of the destructive consequences of such attitudes in the past, nor of their destructive potential for our own societies. And this is absolutely true, but it's also true in some cases that those who express negative attitudes towards minorities, like the Swedish Democrats and their voters, are most certainly aware of history, uh, but they feel it is irrelevant and has nothing to do with them and what they believe in. Uh, they know that the conspiracy theories against Jews were like this and that, and they can be confronted with the similarities between anti-Semitism and, and the Eurabia theory, for instance, but they feel it is irrelevant. So how do you deal with that? That's a completely different uh, problem. And in other cases, those who express negative attitudes towards minorities, like the Swedish resistance movement, consciously evoke the historic imagery of Nazism and crimes of the past to create fear and an image of ruthlessness. So, knowing history is unfortunately uh, not in itself a cure for anything. It's not a cure for xenophobia and it's not a cure for anti-Semitism. And I, I personally find this one of the most depressing and disturbing facts in the history of humanity that even Holocaust, even the systematic pan-European attempt to murder every single Jew could not put an end to anti-Semitism or even Nazism. So, okay, with this in mind, um, can you wave at me when my time is running out? I'm terrible at, at um, staying within the time limit. A few months ago, I published a book about the deportation of the Norwegian Jews to Auschwitz, which happened in 1942 and 1943. I'm not Jewish, although many, many people have asked me that over the past couple of months, um, as if um, the Holocaust is a Jewish concern and not a concern for all of humanity. Uh, but my interest in the, in the Holocaust started with a personal experience. I was given a book by my father for Christmas. It's about 10 years ago. It was about a young Jewish girl who was deported from Norway when she was 15 years old. Uh, her name was Kate Lasnik. And about halfway through the book about her, I realized that she and I had lived in the same apartment. The book is based on archival material, so every single known archival fact about Kate and her family are stated in the book. And there it was, the address to the flat where I had lived when I myself was her age, although many, many decades later. Uh, it was Fredensborg Street on the third floor, the apartment to the left. And Kate's room was the smallest, the one that I had had. So I remember losing my breath and becoming dizzy reading this. The, the realization that I had shared um, the, the floors and the ceiling and the windowsill of a Jewish girl who was deported. Um, and I had never known. I had never known her story. There was nothing in or around the building that this flat was in that 
uh, served as a reminder that uh, he here a Jewish family had lived. Uh, there was nothing in the neighborhood to testify to the fact that this area had been swarming with Jewish families in the 30s. So up until then, up until reading that book, Holocaust, for me, was something that had happened somewhere else, somewhere really far away. But it hadn't. It had, I realized, happened in my streets, uh, in my town, in my room, in a way. And I felt ashamed then that I knew so little. I felt um, a, a commitment grow. I felt an obligation to find out as much as I could about Holocaust in Norway. And let me just give you a very, very brief overview. When Germany occupied Norway in April of 1940, there were only about 2,100 Jews in the uh, country. Uh, that's one of the smallest Jewish populations anywhere in Europe. And most Norwegians had never met a Jew their entire life. Even though they were so few, the Jews in Norway were still drawn into the Nazi Endlösung, and more than half of the Norwegians that died in German concentration camps were Jews. But for many decades, the disaster that befell the Jewish community in Norway was either silenced or forgotten or twisted slightly. Uh, when the history of the war was written uh, in the decades after, uh, afterwards, a big uh, parenthesis was quickly placed around what had happened to the Jews. I'll give you just one example. In one of the first major historical works on the war called Norway's War, Norges Krieg, published in three volumes from 1947 to 1950, the Jews are hardly mentioned. And when we finally get to the deportations to Auschwitz, we are given a very short description of that, and it's accompanied by a very telling sentence, which goes like this. Even such an awful tragedy as this is still just a detail in the abyss of brutality and ruthlessness that the Germans displayed in their prisons. Holocaust was just a detail, and now let's get back to what really happened during the war, the persecution of the Norwegian resistance. This was the perspective for a very long time. Uh, the deportations of the Jews from Norway became a story of a foreign people, the Germans, who came to our country and targeted another foreign people, the Jews. Auschwitz was awful, of course, but it had nothing to do with us. The Norwegian policemen and bureaucrats who were instrumental in making the reg uh, registration, arrests, and uh, uh, deportation of the Jews possible disappeared out of the history writing. And they remained there on the outside for um, 50 years. It was only in the 90s that any serious and academic Holocaust research began in Norway. And of course, this is, situation is similar to, to many other European countries. The level and extent of local collaboration has been downplayed or denied. The pre-existing anti-Semitism in each country has been smoothed over by the projection that the Nazis sort of brought anti-Semitism with them uh, when they came as occupiers. And throughout my childhood, I heard in speeches, especially on the 17th of May, which is our um, national day, that we must never forget. But what was it that we were supposed to remember? It was certainly not that Norway explicitly did not want Jewish refugees in the 30s. From 1933 until 1940, we took five, less than 500 Jewish refugees. Uh, in a situation where hundreds of thousands were desperately trying to get away from Hitler Germany. And it's certainly not the fact that the Norwegian exile government in London during the war years did nothing to warn the Jews about the alarming reports they were receiving of systematic mass murder um, of the deported Jews from France and Holland. So, we must never forget but we need to renegotiate what it is that we're supposed to remember in this story. And the response um, to, uh, to this, I, I bring up these, uh, these, some of these, sorry. <laughs> sorry, my phone. Um, 
these are some of the things that I, I bring up in my book. They have been discussed before in Norway, but uh, the dynamic around the book made these issues, um, um, it gave these issues a lot more attention than they have received um, in, uh, earlier. And the reaction from many of the established um, uh, um, historians who have worked on this field is that, okay, that's a nice little book, but you should have written so much more about the helpers. We can talk about these issues, that's no problem, but we have to talk about the helpers. Um, and this is, of course there were helpers, uh, as there were in, in Poland. In Poland, I believe, 50,000 uh, Polish people were executed for helping Jews, is that correct? Something, something in that vicinity. Um, and of course, uh, highlighting the, the, the possibility to, to make a difference, uh, the moral room that you had during a German occupation is of course essential to, to explaining, um, to also establishing uh, any kind of morality in that situation. Of, of, of course we have to talk about the helpers. Uh, but it's very similar to the heated and um, um, sometimes very hard discussion that has been going on in Poland about Jedwabne. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, the, the Jedwabne controversy, which has a lot of the same elements. Okay, we can talk about this, but shouldn't we rather be talking about all of those who did the opposite thing, all of the helpers? So we see some, I mean, there are some threads in uh, the different European uh, abilities to deal with their, uh, with, the, with the nasty sides of their own uh, partaking in the Holocaust that, are, that are, are, have been dealt with in a sort of nationally appropriate way, in a way that has uh, functioned to, to uh, beef up the identity of heroic resistance during the war, which became so instrumental for the national identity in the whole post-war era. Um, we are Norwegians because we acted like this during German occupation. Uh, being this type of Polish person is a result of how we were during occupation, and so on. Uh, and we're seeing it now massively in Russia with the preparations for the 75th anniversary, um, how uh, the identity of the war is being exploited in a uh, fascinating way to, to foster Putin's uh, agenda. So, okay, this, you can say, yeah, I'm going to round off, but you can say that um, th these, um, these, these uh, carefully crafted uh, and, and no, um, th th this approach to history, where certain areas are no-go uh, because, they, because they're damaging to the whole idea of what the war was about, uh, and um, the, the reluctance to opening up for all of those wrong and, and bad things that Norwegians might have done or, or any local population might have done. I believe that these, that approach is a big hindrance towards the ability to connect with history. I think, as I said earlier, the imagery of Nazism is very, very active and vivid, but uh, the job today is to connect that uh, huge culturally uh, common uh, uh, knowledge of the Holocaust to something uh, local, to place Holocaust into its local setting. For, for instance, uh, for decades, Norwegians, N Norway has been sending young Norwegians on trips to Auschwitz, to Poland, uh, to see the end uh, part of the process that started at home. Uh, when instead, of, instead we could have, or maybe in addition to, we could have shown them the internment camps that the Jews were first hauled to in Norway. We could have shown them the streets and buildings where Norwegian policemen dragged men, women, and children to the trains and boats that ended in Auschwitz. Um, I, I, th that has a very different impact. Uh, then it has something to do with you and your story and not something to do with them and far away. Okay, finally, just a really short thing about this. Um, how, how, how do we talk about this? When I, talk to when I uh, am out talking to pupils and to teachers, I 
always focus on um, the fact that I fell in love with uh, parts of Jewish and especially Jiddish culture when I researched this book, which was a big surprise to me because I came from a, from a, a position of sort of interested empathy. Uh, but I mean, this is in, in Yiddish, you have one word for joke and one word for little joke, a witz and a witzel. This is great. <laughs> this is the kind of culture that can produce common cultural icons like Seinfeld, uh, like Woody Allen. And I always highlight to the, to the pupils who feel that, this, that they don't know anything about the Jews, the fact that they really do know so much about the Jews because it's, it's all over and they don't notice. And this, I think, is also something that is uh, great to talk about, especially in, in, in groups of, of pupils where there are many immigrant uh, children, that you, you have to see the voyage of the Jewish um, community as an incredibly hopeful um, um, story. This was a group that was treated horrendously uh, and long before the war uh, and met the same uh, suspicions and the same uh, group enmity that many, especially uh, young Muslims, are experiencing today. And to try to go, I think, I think a very important antidote to the anti-Semitism that we are seeing, which is rampant and really scary in many Muslim communities, uh, is to, to, to develop that solidarity and that feeling that uh, a social transformation, the, the transformation of social status that happened to the Jews, going from being uh, the worst uh, of the earth to being some of the most um, powerful and idealized uh, uh, on the planet, uh, is, has, which is very simplified, but that has, a, that has a, a, a very positive thing to it. And I always ask the classes, who will be next? Who is going to make that journey? Uh, who around us today are hated and despised uh, and uh, met with contempt, but who will in 10, 15, or maybe 100 years be a group that has totally transformed social status? And that's always a good uh, uh, point for discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this was really, thank you, a, a lecture in its own right. Um, if you have watched the watch, which I have been doing, be calm. We have postponed the start of the workshop a quarter of an hour because we started late because of the technical problems, which means we have five minutes for questions. Uh, and I think you, you and... Professor Sick, you, you left us also with some kind of dilemmas. I think you, you very powerfully showed how looking to the past can, or historicization, can, can alienate, can, can make us ask new questions, reflect on what we took for granted. At the same time, I think we got some some points here which also can be taken to the workshops when we work with anti-Semitism, with hate speech, um, which are dilemmas. Is it, is it the right thing to focus on the extremes, on the genocide, on what, what it can lead to? Or as also Professor Zick has said, the normalization, the prejudice that becomes normal, that be that is settled in the middle. It's not only the, the Nazis de dressed in threatening ways, but that creepy thing in the middle of society. So how, how to, to deal with that, how, how to balance that? Then the last point you made, the perpetrators, the, the helpers. What, what, what should the narratives we're, we're teaching do? Are they, are they to, to cr create distance and critical reflection? or? positive role models, identification, or both, but when? So I think we have lots of questions.